I think um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that ideas are great. Arguments are great. Nobody's mind is changed by a logical argument. A logical argument is a really important part of changing someone's mind. But the reason someone makes a dramatic change in the way that they live, in their convictions, is because their imagination has been captured. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny Burka and Marlo Slayback. We are glad to be joined by our colleague today, Jane Scharl, who is the seminar manager at ISI. She holds a bachelor's degree in politics, philosophy, and economics from the King's College, New York City, and a master of fine arts from Seattle Pacific University. Jane has served as a senior editor for the European Conservative. She is a poet, playwright, and essayist, and and her work has appeared in prominent outlets on both sides of the Atlantic, including the BBC, the New Ohio Review, the Hopkins Review, the American Journal of Poetry, The Lamp, The New Criterion, and others. Her verse play, Sonne les Matins, opened in New York City in February 2023. Great to be chatting with you, Jane. Hi, thanks. It's good to be here. Before we get to our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is Educating for Liberty. So if you'd like to join us in fulfilling this mission, be sure to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So it's my pleasure to um, have Jane on the podcast, and me and Jane have been talking for, um, I think, maybe two years now about the subject of the arts and specifically, um, you know, everything from just creative writing and poetry and how to infuse that more into a holistic education, especially among conservatives. So I'm very happy that she's here to join us because, um, you know, just I've spoken to listeners of this podcast just out in the wild before. And um, the interests are usually, you know, some of the, the, um, the meat of what we, we talk about on this podcast, which usually is, you know, contemporary issues and um, things like, you know, politics, economics, things like that. Um, which is great, which is why we cover it so much. Another issue that, not so much issue, but perhaps it, it, it is presenting itself as one today, is that um, we don't have enough beauty in our lives. And so this is something me and Jane bonded over. Um, it was probably my first month or two working at ISI, and I think Johnny connected me with Jane. Um, I forget what the background there was, because two years feels like it was forever ago. But um, I just remember thinking, like, Oh, a kindred spirit. We and we really seem to um, just agree on this fundamental issue that um, conservatives need to care more and bring beauty to kind of the the, the forefront of their everyday lives and make it a um, a priority. Whether that's you know um, just our just the more mundane routines, but also um, into our our conversations about topics that perhaps seem separated from that, but can be integrated with how we conceive of beauty. So maybe that's where we start the conversation is, and we can talk more about Jane's recommendations for people who perhaps are novices, but would like to incorporate, you know, poetry and other things that seem to have a high barrier entry into their daily lives. But why should we care, Jane? Why is this something that you're clearly passionate about? You've spoken at our conferences about this before. Um, and something that you as a you know, practitioner of, of beauty through your poetry, through your you know, being a playwright, why is this something that people should care about? Yeah, so I think um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that ideas are great. Arguments are great. Nobody's mind is changed by a logical argument. A logical argument is a really important part of changing someone's mind. But the reason someone makes a dramatic change in the way that they live in their convictions is because their imagination has been captured. And that doesn't happen purely through some sort of rational or logical sequence. You have to have those things. It's really important. That's sort of the scaffolding. But the thing that really transforms people's lives is imagination. And we appeal to the imagination through beauty, through narrative, through patterns. And those are all elements of art. You can find those elements in the best philosophy, but um, they're central to art. You don't have art without beauty, narrative, and pattern. So um, when we when we talk about the importance of beauty, we're not talking about it as some sort of frosting on the cake. You know, we've got the cake of politics and then we put the frosting of art on top. It's not like that at all. It's If anything, it's almost the opposite, I would say, where you have 
people who are living in the world, their imaginations are formed in a certain direction and their politics are going to come from their imaginative vision of the world. So for example, people's in their imaginations think of themselves either as an individual who is capable of defining his or her own reality or as a part of a community who is inheriting certain truths from that community. That's an imaginative thing, how you imagine the world and your role in it. And that can be shaped through beauty. It is shaped through beauty, through art, through poetry and music. So that's why we care because, um, when you, when you want to begin to show people how to live beautifully and excellently and with true liberty, you've got to have that imaginative shaping going alongside the intellectual shaping. Jane, I think that's a, a really profound point that logic is not what persuades someone at first. Oftentimes, actually, you know, the logic comes afterwards as a way of justifying, yeah. you know, why do you want to buy a new house? Why do you want to m marry this person? Why do you know, fill in the blank? You exactly. sort of want it first because you're captivated. And then you create the rational arguments for why it, it makes sense. Um, I'm curious, I was having a conversation with a, another friend of mine who's also a poet and her name is Jane and I need to introduce you to. <laughs> and we were yes, talking with a, a small group yesterday and uh, one of the, the issues that we were exploring, uh, and this actually touches on something that, that Marlo has um, mentioned before, the idea of beauty being a populist virtue, or perhaps better put, beauty is something that's accessible, um, is something that's held in common, you know, in a community, mm -hmm. something that, you know, your, your average person could walk into a, a beautiful cathedral, right, and be blown away. They, they may even be able to see that beauty um, and resonate with it more profoundly than someone who has a PhD in art who has, you know, gone down all these obscure intellectual rabbit holes and sees problems with everything. So, you know, I had sort of this sense of, of hope that, you know, the beautiful, you know, to, to kind of touch on what, you know, Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky have said, you know, when truth and goodness aren't getting through because people's senses are dead and, you know, beauty, beauty can and, and will save the world. And uh, one of the, 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 uh, my friends kind of responded saying, you know, they were worried that even beauty might not be able to break through today, that people's um, senses are so, you know, deformed, whether it's through constantly being on TikTok or social media or short attention spans, that you could present, you know, that great work of poetry to them and it might do nothing, you know? So yeah. is there, are you equally as pessimistic and, and, you know, let's say you are, let's say we take that premise at face value. <laughs> are there things that we can do to prepare people to receive the beautiful if their, their senses are not quite ready to go all the way right, right away? Sure. That's a, that's a really good question. And I, um, I'll say I'm not really a pessimistic or an optimistic person. Like I don't actually sit around and think about whether large masses of people are in a certain state. I, I tend to more think about, okay, what is happening in the people that I speak with in my life? And um, that's just more helpful for me. And and I, I think in, in those people, what I'm seeing is a, an interest in what they want to understand art, especially contemporary art. And it's really hard for them to do that um, because contemporary art is such an odd thing. Um, so what can we do to help people feel more confident and comfortable in viewing art? Um, what the, the roadmap that I would lay out for people is this. There's got to be something that you know is beautiful and is good. Everyone's got something. Maybe it's a building, maybe it's a painting, maybe it's a sculpture, but it's something that you have received from someone else They've told you it's good. You trust that person. You trust the environment that taught you that it was good. So you're going to say that's a good and beautiful thing. Then don't just look at it and say that's good and beautiful. Instead, ask yourself, what are the characteristics that make this beautiful? And just study one thing. If that's all you've got in your imagination is that one thing, just, just sit with it. If you know you like Michelangelo's David, don't worry about whether it's cliche 
just look at it and ask yourself, what is it that moves me? And what you're doing when you do that is you're developing a critical faculty. You're, you're, in, you're learning to look at the world and ask critical aesthetic questions. And you're, you're noticing, okay, when, when you take the form, the material form of a piece of art and you work with it in a certain way, you get beauty. So then take what you notice about that piece of art that you know is beautiful and find something else and ask those questions. So just try to expand out piece by piece. Don't tackle contemporary art right away. Um, don't, don't worry about it. It's first of all, this whole notion that we can know right now what is good art, what's the best art, what's lasting art, that's ridiculous. When Shakespeare published, there he was one among many, many English Renaissance playwrights. And he wasn't even always the most popular. He fluctuated in popularity in comparison with his contemporaries, even for for decades, for a hundred years after. It was kind of Shakespeare among others. We didn't Shakespeare didn't really rise to the top until 200 years after his death. Um, and I think that when we put this pressure on ourselves to say, oh, there's a new exhibit downtown. I can't decide if that's great art or not. Well, of course you can't decide if it's great art or not. You're not an entire generation of people. And that's what it takes is multiple generations to decide what's great. So take that critical faculty that you've honed by studying what you know is great and go apply it to the art show downtown. You probably won't find the next great masterpiece, but you might find something that shows you a new element of beauty or a new way to use a material or something like that. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I usually tell people is just take it piece by piece and don't make it your responsibility to understand art. Just follow your own sense of beauty that you have tested and tried. It's kind of like shaping your conscience. You know, you're like, well, I know that telling a lie to my mother is wrong. So I'm going to use that piece of information to decide whether telling a lie in this situation is wrong. It's that, that it's your, your aesthetic sense develops the same way as a conscience. Something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially in developing this aesthetic sense is like the, the, I guess the concepts of disenchantment and irony. Um, I'm reading a book right now on um, Russian, so, well, specifically Soviet culture. So like, kind of early 20th century. And something that was like really heartbreaking for me to read was when um, the Bolsheviks uh, were trying to basically disenchant um, and trying to subvert the peasant reliance on God um, to rather than what the, the French revolutionaries or yeah, the French revolutionaries did was try to disenchant them totally from God. They were trying to subvert or um, appropriate the hold that God had on the population um, so that it would be a worship of state. So just state atheism. And the way that they did this was just, it was really like, I almost like started tearing up as I was reading this, but they would um, like pay for um, like peasants to get on airplanes so that they could fly into the sky and see that there was no God there. Um, they wow. would tell them that, yeah, that these, um, these like saints uh, that these dead saints, their bodies weren't um, incorrupted. So they would show them like, no, they're really wax. Right. Like just, it, I mean, just total abuse of the spirit, right? And um, it just made me think about, you know, I'm not even sure if this is worse now or in the case that I think everything is so steeped in irony that at least the peasants there could like see through what they were trying to, sh to you know, destroy in them. But I'm not so sure now it's, it's more like just this um, disaffection and irony that almost cloaks the ability or at least disorders it to use that aesthetic, um, you know, that, that sensibility. It almost seems natural. Like, I mean, Johnny said earlier, something I, I love to say is that beauty is, is, is effectively populist, uh, essentially populist, where the commoner can look at like, you know, Bernini's David and just be so, um, just be in, they know they're in the presence of something beautiful and great and, and, and just something that took immense human um, talent and excellence to sculpt. Um, but now it's, I don't know, like if I took a group of students there, would they, maybe if they're conservative, they'd see that. But I almost feel like if it was your common, you know, your, your average college student who wasn't an ISI student, would they yeah. be seeing the same thing as us? Um, not to say that human nature has been 
um, you know, totally perverted in a, like, the Darwinian way, I guess they'd say, or it's evolved because that's obviously nearly impossible to do, um, as a good conservative would say. But I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? That's just something I've been kind of, like, tinkering. Like it's, I've just been kind of thinking about it a lot. And maybe is that something that you've seen from the young people that you've talked to, um, the people who've approached your poetry or that you've discussed this topic with? You, you're, you've got your finger on something for sure that, um, between irony and when we, when we, when we say irony, what we're meaning is this assumption that what we read, what we see, what we hear isn't actually the message, that there's some sort of, that there's some sort of message under the art. That's, that's what we mean when we're talking about ironic art here. Um, and, Obviously, there's something deeper going on with art, you know, but it's it's not always subversive. Sometimes I think that's that's what people assume is that there's some kind of power narrative upholding art. So that's where we I don't like to toss around the idea of Marxism because it it gets overused. But there is a very um, Marxist. There's an idea that art is Marxist in that art is always interested in power and it's it's often simply not. So, but what you're what you're talking about Marlo is overlaying our experience of art with those those critical sensibilities where we're trying to figure out okay, what's the real narrative here? Um in that instance, the only thing that I have found to be successful that can break through and this is not universally successful. Sometimes people just they just can't break out of that that critical box. But the thing that I have found to be helpful is to emphasize the material, the use of material, where you say, okay, let's just assume that this famous sculpture is in fact part of a narrative of patriarchy. Okay, there it is. However, so I'm thinking of the, this, the, um, the sculpture in the Villa Borghese, the Daphne and um, Apollo, Apollo and Daphne, Daphne. that one. Yes. Uh, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The Bernini one. Yeah. So, okay. Let's assume that it's part of a narrative of patriarchy. Fine. Just look at the stone. Just look at the stone. Look at what was done with the stone. Don't worry about the, the narrative. We, we can just, except that it's patriarchic if we have to. But look at what he was able to do with the material. And if we can focus on that, we can sometimes help people see art as beauty. And then the question, then you ask them, okay, what do you think it took to become that skilled with matter? to shape matter that way. Do you think you can shape matter that way if you believe that the world is fully material, if you're a materialist, if you believe that um, power is the only dynamic that brings people together? Do you really think that you can become the kind of person who can shape material into such beauty if you don't believe in something beyond that material. And that line of questioning doesn't always work, but I have seen it work um, to focus on the, 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 the form. And when I say the form, I mean the paint strokes, the words on the page, the sound of the notes. And sometimes that can snap people out because a lot of the time when we look at art, we're not actually looking at the art. We're looking at some sort of overlaid narrative but when you stop and you actually get up close to it and you study what was done to transform, in the case of paint, clay and oil and ground up gems into this spectacular image, it's, it's very few people can resist the wonder of that process, even if they don't like the result, if that's helpful. Yeah, definitely. Jane, uh, curious uh, to to dive in a little bit into the the history of poetry, and then you know we'll have a follow up question about kind of the field of of poetry today. But I think when many people think of of poetry, they think of okay, this is something uh, you do as an individual. This is a solitary activity. 
you grab a book off the shelf. Um, you know, it's sort of in funny rhymes. It's a little bit difficult to understand. You're, you're there with your cup of coffee and you're kind of trudging <laughs> through it. And then you're like, all right, like, let me look at my phone or put on a <laughs> show on Netflix. Like, so I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, what is poetry? What is the context? You know, how is it meant to be enjoyed? And um, are there people in places doing that today as it originally was done instead of, you know, people just in a freshman seminar trying to kind of, you know, plow through a, a, a text for a, a essay or a midterm? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and I, so I'm a professional poet. This is my vocation. I rarely sit alone in a room and open a book of poetry and read it to myself. Like that's not something that I do with my time because it's not enjoyable to me. If I'm going to read poetry, I'm going to be reading it aloud, probably walking around in my living room. Um, like I'm trying to reread the Aeneid. And it's really difficult for me to just sit and read it in a chair. So I read it, I put it up and I read it while I'm washing dishes or something. I read it out loud. Um, so I think if people have that experience with poetry and they think, oh, I just don't like poetry because I'm just sitting here reading it. Well, no, it's not that you don't like poetry and it's not that you're too dumb to understand poetry. I think a lot of people approach poetry feel dumb because they don't get into it and drop it. That's not, you're not too dumb to read poetry. Um, it's just poetry isn't being, you're not being taught how you're supposed to read poetry. So poetry is, um, it was born as an oral art, meaning its brother is music. It is not actually closely related to, um, speech, political speech, or prose. It's not as closely related to those arts as it is to music way back at the beginning. So when you think of poetry, um, you're thinking, so think about how you experience music. You know, the ideal musical experience would be you're at a concert um, and there's a lot of people with you and you know the words and you know the music and you're all singing together. Um, or you're at an opera and you've listened to this opera, you know, you've heard the recording over and over again, and then you get to go and you hear a famous soprano or tenor sing the aria. Um, and that's the experience that poetry is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a communal experience that brings people together and they share an aural experience that brings them out of themselves, out of their individualness into a communal setting. That's really not how we do poetry today. Um, so to, and I mean, I don't really know places that are doing that super actively. You can go and you can hear spoken word poetry at like slam poetry nights and stuff. And sometimes you hear really, really good things. Actually, there's a line um, that my husband heard at a slam poetry night that this was like 12 years ago and we still say it because it was so good. It was this revolutionary poet in Phoenix. And he, he said, we will rise like bisquick. <laughs> and I'm never going to forget that. Cause it, but if that had been written on a page, I wouldn't remember it. But the way it was said and the way it sounds, I still think we will rise like bisquick. So you can go and you can find poetry that has that communal element. It's often not the best poetry, though. It isn't necessarily the most formally rigorous or the most um, grounded in the tradition of like the like letters. So it's not doing that thing where it's referring back to other poetry and stuff like that. My solution to this is I just write drama. Um, when you write verse drama, then when people read it, 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 it's a lot more natural for them to get together and read it aloud because, oh, look, this is a speech that someone says I should read it aloud. Um, I also, I, I write a lot of narrative, um, dramatic monologues, which are in the voice of a specific person. So then you're tempted more to read them out loud. I think you can do things as an artist to sort of trap your reader into, into, oh, this is supposed to be spoken. I'm going to speak it. Um, you can also, I mean, people can, there's great recordings of Shakespeare plays online. You can check those out. You can listen to them. If you don't love Shakespeare on the page, try listening to it. Um, try going to see it. Because, yeah, if you if you just had that experience of poetry where you read it and it wasn't particularly dynamic, find a way to share it with, with other people. Read it aloud with a friend, even. And um, I 
bet you'll find that it moves you more deeply. And I can give some tips on how to find poetry that you like later if that's helpful because there's so much out there and it's sometimes hard to know where to start. Yeah, we definitely love to have recommendations, especially think that, I mean, I studied poetry at, as a minor to, um, you know, other creative writing. Um, but my experience at a public university was largely like the slam poetry. I mean, it was fine, but most, if not like, I would say 85, 90% of the slam poets I encountered, unfortunately were, I mean, it was mostly like very progressive, like almost sometimes radical left type stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was all imbued with like this, just a lot of grievance. And that certainly has a place in writing. If there's any place, like it is absolutely in writing. Um, some of the most, you know, um, influential pieces of writing are from times in history that um, were able to be creatively um, communicated through literature. But I think a lot of conservatives feel, and maybe this is, just something that we will put in the show notes is I, I reckon everyone read Dana Joya's piece from like, I think it was like the early nineties in the Atlantic. It's called can poetry matter. And, um, I think that's what it's called. Uh, pretty certain that's what it's called, but that is what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, I mean, I don't think much has changed since he's written that piece. Um, I think a lot of Americans still feel that poetry is kind of siloed. It's in the ivory towers of academia, um, it has a high barrier for entry. Perhaps it has this rich oral tradition and you have this folk poetry. I mean, um, I know like in, in the Arab world, for example, I'm saying this just as someone with Syrian heritage, like Mahmoud Darwish um, was a, a, a poet who really was, you know, across the Arab world, everyone knew him, Mahmoud Darwish is. I don't know if any Americans can name a poem or a poet today rather that is, is there a contemporary that was someone that's alive. Um, and maybe they can name some artists like, uh, or like rappers or singers. Um, like I know Kendrick Lamar for a rapper is pretty, he's a pr pretty rigorous. I would say someone who likes his music, um, for like pop music, I guess, um, music that people listen to, but, um, a lot of people listen to, but I don't know. What are your thoughts on, is that, is that actually happening? Like, is this maybe something that has maybe music and pop music has taken the space that poetry once held? Um, cause it's just much more easily proliferated and remembered. And do you think that, is there any national literature, American literature, especially American poets today that you think that, um, a lot of people would actually read and say like, wow, I can relate to that. And this really, like, this is something that isn't, um, isn't ironic. It isn't, you know, something that's meant for like one narrow community. It's something that can be widely consumed or rather. That's a very, like, that's a very material word. Um, something that can be widely enjoyed. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my short answer would be, I don't think that there's anyone doing that kind of work right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that work isn't happening. Probably the main one being, um, I mean, we don't really know what America is right now. So it's difficult to have a sense of, you know, national art when you don't have a strong sense of nation. Now, this is not unprecedented. Um, you, you often have these periods in art history where the art has to go back to being deeply local before it can become something that has a broader reach. So, I mean, when you look at art history, most art just, drops away. Like many, many periods of history, we don't have art from that period. What we have is you can see it working under the surface and then 150 years later, there's some massive piece. Um, and like Dante is a great example of this. For a really long time in Italy, we don't really have a record of what was going on. We know that there were, that there were robust local artistic traditions, but they weren't, you know, world changing. Um, and then gradually as Italy sort of entered this new period of starting to think about itself differently and the city states were beginning to think about themselves with more discrete identities and there were, there was a stronger sense of culture. Um, then you could have someone like Dante take those threads of the local traditions and weave something new. 
Um, but for it, it takes a really long time. I mean, you see that with Beowulf. Like there isn't much, and then there's Beowulf. There isn't much, and then there's Dante and Petrarch and all these other Italian poets who all come together at the same time. So I don't think we need to be in despair that we don't have this. Sometimes it just doesn't happen, you know? Sometimes you've just got a, a little, you've got a broken down thing. And when you're an artist, you got to take a long view. I mean, what I'm doing right now, I'm not the world's, I'm not the next great artist. But what I am trying to do is make it so that when the next great artist comes, there's there's something sticky for him or her to use. I'm just trying to to create the stickiness in language that I can push to the next generation. And I think that just happens in seasons. Um, so the best thing that I think people can do is don't worry about having massive reach. Worry about having deep connections with your small community. Don't, don't become tribal. Don't content yourself to write only to a certain ideology. But it's fine if you don't have a global reach with your poetry. Most ideas don't have a global reach. But if you can have a reach where in your neighborhood, which is probably pretty diverse, you know, pretty, pretty, um, there's probably a lot of different ways of thinking in your neighborhood. If you can make the people in your neighborhood interested in art, if you can write something that appeals to their shared sense of life, you've, that's an accomplishment. You've done something. So that's kind of my thought on that. And that's where I am a little of a pessimist. Some people might say you can still do those bigger things. And I just, I don't think, I don't think that that's the best use of creative energy because when you, I think when you're trying to reach a huge audience, you dissipate your own powers. Um, so just try to reach the audience that you can see around you. And I think you'll be shocked by how much bigger your audience actually is. That's how, that's what I would encourage people. Jane, I'm wondering if you could talk about the relationship between uh, poetry, patronage, and politics, and historically even perhaps reflecting on this, because at, at different points in history, you know, you had wealthy families, maybe the Medici family, right, that sponsored artists, or you have the emperor, you know, Augustus, you know, uh, yeah. you know sponsoring art. Um, how... And then today, you you probably I don't know I, my my guess is you have a mix of certain uh, funding that comes from the National Endowment of the Arts, uh, but then you also probably have you know foundations, major foundations that are supporting work in the arts. Um, can you talk about this? There's a tension between those three things, but there's also a relationship historically and perhaps even today. Um, can you talk on that a little bit and then? Maybe describe what you would like to see or your hopes for future patronage of the arts that could be done better than it's currently doing uh, today. Yeah, that's a question I'm actually really p passionate about um, because there there is a robust patronage system um, in America right now, but it is largely viewpoint specific. And if you hold certain viewpoints, whether those things are, show up in your art or not, you are excluded from from participating in the patronage system. And it's just the same stuff we've come to expect from academia and all of that. You know, you need to be prepared to um, support the transgender agenda. You need to be okay with abortion. You need to be okay with these sort of far left talking points in order to be eligible for that patronage system. So that's really bad. Um, you... <laughs> What you end up with then is potentially really good artists simply not getting the support. And then you end up with a lot of the same kinds of art getting funded. And it's, it's really lopsided. And I think that's a lot of why you see this disaffection with um, the fine arts among many Americans. It's because there's just not a lot of diversity in the fine art that's being publicized. Now, the good news is there is a ton of diversity in the fine art that's being produced. You just don't see it because there's no publicity for it. And people always, I hear people say, oh, I just feel like there's no audience for my work because I'm religious or because I'm conservative. And I have to tell them, no, there is an audience. It's massive. You just can't reach them. And, and that's okay. It's not your fault. But there are so many people who would love to be able to engage with 
fine art that has to do with our moment, but isn't aggressively leftist. So the the missing piece there is funding and programming that promotes and elevates fine art um, from people who are sort of excluded because of their viewpoint. The trick, of course, is do we end up then creating our own viewpoint parameters where it says, oh, well, you have to be a conservative or you have to make conservative art. Well, um, that's going to be death to art because when you start imposing an ideology on art and saying your art has to meet certain ideological standards, then you're going to squish art, um, which is what we see happening on the left. And it could just as easily happen on the right. So we, we would have to be really careful how we, how we verbalize this. So um, my ideal, this is how I've kind of been, I've been toying with this for years of what could, what could happen. And this is sort of what I've gotten to. Um, it would be really neat to see the organizations that promote conservative ideas um, in politics and economics, to see them develop parallel tracks to promote conservative ideas in art. And the way that that would have to be done is um, the art itself would be viewpoint neutral. So it wouldn't matter what was expressed in the art. Um, but we can, we can determine um, based on someone's ideas about beauty, their ideas about truth. Do we believe that truth is knowable? That could be a, a, a question that's part of a, of an application. Do you believe truth? Do you believe there is truth? And do you believe we can know it? That actually, that, that eliminates a lot of people. Um, and it brings out a lot of people who aren't getting a lot of attention. So, but that's not an ideological question. That's not what do you believe we should be doing in the Middle East? You know, that's a basic philosophical question. Um, so I think if we could create programming that looked for people who had robust metaphysics and allowed those people to work freely, we would really find that there's great art being done and it can happen in small, small chunks. I mean, I'll just give even some examples in case there are some listeners who hear this and say, oh, I want to become a patron. It's really easy. Um, find an artist, find one on Twitter, ask Marlo, ask Johnny, ask your ISI people, who's a good artist? Find that person, um, offer them $50 to have takeout for dinner for their kids instead of cooking. And what you've just given them is two hours of time that they can work on their art instead of cooking and cleaning the kitchen. Or if you want to give a bigger gift, offer them $300 to do a retreat, um, a, a two-day retreat. They can get an Airbnb. They can buy packaged food and not have to cook. And then they get two days to work on their art. It's not a huge investment for a patron, but for an artist, that's the kind of thing that will keep you going. Um, little things like that, if we created a an environment among conservatives that when we see beauty and we see potential, artistic potential, we support that, I I think this conversation would look really different. Even in 10 years, the the results would be wild. And then there's obviously bigger things. We could scale it. We could have artists in residence at large conservative think tanks, and they could be respected just as much as economics experts and public policy experts. I mean, these culture makers are just as important in doing the things that we want to do. So that's my soapbox on that. <laughs> I have lots more ideas on that if anyone wants to talk more about it, because I really do think that's a missing piece that we should be working on. I'm sure we'll talk a ton about this, Jane, because it's <laughs> I'm also really passionate about. Um, and I think it was one of the first things I like brought up when I came yeah. back. I was just, you know, this is a place where conservatives need to pick up the ball because the left has been running circles around us for a while. But I think you're right that we have to be really careful with the language and how we vet people because we don't want to, um, we don't want to fall in the same trap that it's not even a trap. The left, I mean, is deliberately yeah. doing that. Right. But, yeah. um, you know, maybe we're looking for, um, we're looking for people who are going through the conventional routes to get art funding, but are falling short of the, you know, the, I don't know, the DEI requirements or whatever, yeah. some of the, you know, the different hurdles that are being put up in, um, these government run, you know, organizations and, um, and these endowments and things like that and, and fellowships, whatever. 
Um, but they would find friendly, you know, they'd find allies on the right. They just, because the right, I, I would think most of us, they just want to see beautiful stuff. Like we just want to see yeah. beautiful architecture and we're not as interested in, you know, like, um, in like this type of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, in like these purity tests. So, um, sure. least, you know, in, in art, um, but my last question is, you know, for people who are um, listening and want to start, you know, maybe build up their um, reading list of poets, but also contemporary writers you'd recommend or even visual um, visual artists that you'd recommend who are practicing today. Maybe there are some interested potential patrons who are listening who are thinking, oh, maybe I'll like get someone, you know, I'll give someone $200 for an evening where um, they can, you know, have a babysitter watch their kids so they could like, you know, oil paint or write or something, sure. um, who are some of the people out there that you'd recommend listeners follow? Okay. So you want you contemporary yeah. working right now? Oh, so it's yeah. If anyone who's working or maybe, you know, anyone recent that you think people would be interested in, like as a kind of, I guess, a rudimentary introduction to yeah. this entire world. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, the first name, he's pretty, pretty significant, actually. Um, not a small artist, but Amit Majmudar. Um, he's a Hindu artist working out of um, Ohio, really interesting voice, bringing together a lot of cultures and a lot of languages in what he's doing. And I love his work because he, he um, just in his life, he kind of checks the boxes of all the inner, inner, um, what is it? Intersectionality. You know, he's got, he's a minority. He's, yeah, yeah he's, he's a minority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a minority in several ways, but his work doesn't focus on that at all. Um, and it, it, I think it startles people to see someone who's, who's not using his identity, but is rather just creating beautiful things. Um, and he, he works in all kinds of different, different genres and he's a very exciting younger artist to follow. Um, then there's also, um, so a, a, a good way to find good, good artists would be look at the small presses um, or small arts groups. So there's Wise Blood. They're my publisher. Um, I love the stuff that they're producing. They they work with a lot of really excellent translators to bring international literature into English, which is great because there's, there's, there's a huge need for that. Um, they've got the novelists Sally Thomas and Katie Carl, fantastic artists. Um, Andrew Frizzardi is an, is a poet who he works, um, he does uh, translations from Italian and also original verse. He's really, really good. Um, then there's slant publication, slant press. It's another good small indie press to keep an eye on. Um, they do sort of more traditional fiction and, and novels and things like that. They have a, like a couple of series of murder mysteries if people enjoy that kind of thing. And, um, they're a good one to look at. Then there are some neat organizations, smaller ones. Um, there's the, it's B2B Arts in New York where they have visual artists and dancers and dramatists, actors, and they're doing some really neat things. So definitely check them out. They've got uh, some people doing like really edgy dr things in drama um, that would make, I think they would make people who are, trained in classical art, maybe a little uncomfortable, but I love what they're doing just because it's, um, it's bold and it's new and, but they have that metaphysic that I was talking about. They believe in truth and they believe that what they're doing is seeking truth. So they're really cool B2B art house. Um, the St. Louis, the ninth society is out of Louisiana and they are, they do a lot of work in architecture. So people who are interested in especially sacred architecture, um, St. Louis, the ninth society does neat stuff. Uh, they, and they're pretty new, but they're really exciting and they're very, um, they're very grounded in their, their local area, which I love to see. They're working with local artists. And so, um, they, they encourage people to find people in their area and they give you tips on, okay, how can you connect with people who are around you? Cause they believe in the importance of local culture and building that up. So hopefully that's kind of some, some stuff. Um, Jonathan Leaf is also someone I'll mention. He's not, He's not, a, he, I mean, his work has been reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. He's a pretty significant artist, but he's writing verse drama. Um, his play Pushkin is a verse drama about um, Eugene Onegin. And it's it's a really, the, the the composition of Eugene Onegin by Alexander Pushkin. It's a really good good verse play. Um, 
and that's my my form. So I'm always on the lookout for, for verse dramatists. And he's a really interesting one to follow. So the best thing you can do for patronage is just buy people's art or buy a ticket to their gallery opening, buy their album, just do things to show their publisher, their producer that they have an audience that's willing to pay. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. And we'll include these writers and, and artists in the um, in the show notes. And Great. Um, thank you again, Jane, for being yeah. with us. I think oh, thanks for having me. Our audience's edification. Hopefully people learned a few things and will patronize and, and look into the art of um, these artists, but also your, your work. Um, and where can people find your work? I know you have, you know, published work, you have a, you know, a play and you also have some stuff coming out. So where can people find right. you and, and buy your stuff? Yeah. So you can, if you just put me JC Charl into Amazon, I come up, um, you can buy it on Amazon. You can also buy, buy the first place on Elena Martina through the publisher, which is wise blood. Um, they get more money if you buy through them. So I always say do that. And also if you're looking the the play only has three characters, it's really simple. It's people have a lot of fun getting together and reading it aloud because it has a lot of wordplay and it's very silly. It's a comedy. Um, and I've, I've heard from a lot of people that, you know, it takes an hour to get through and they've had a great time just getting some friends over and reading through it. So that's fun. If you wanted to try something like that, I would be really honored if you did that. Um, I have also a book of lyric poetry coming out next year and the sequel to my play is coming out next year and it's going to be a lot darker and grittier and also hopefully even funnier. So keep an eye out for that. It's called the death of Rabelais. Um, so yeah, and then I I just wanted to say if if anyone who listens has questions on this, um, I have a website j c charl s c h a r l dot com, and you can email me through that. Drop me an email because I love to hear from people. Um, if you have questions about art, how you can grow in art, things to read, just get in touch, and I'd love to continue this conversation with you. And if you're a student um, and you're accepted into or invited to one of our seminars, Jane will be there and we'll play Mafia together. So it will and, be and great. probably <laughs> too with our roving uh, poetry library. So, uh, yes. but thank you again Jane, for joining us and uh, thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to head over to our website, isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the intercollegiate review, select modern age articles, lectures, debates, study guides, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.